at the cord, hallelujah, and let's start in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm just so grateful to you for this morning, uh, for these ladies, for this opportunity, for the power of your Holy Spirit and the purity of your word. And Lord, we just call on your mighty name that your presence would be among us, that we would be able to receive the truth and it would bear fruit within us, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And Lord, I just pray for all those listening by tape that the blessing would just not be deferred but they would get it full measure as well and your Holy Spirit would come to them as they hear and listen and they would open their hearts to receive all your goodness Lord I just commit this teaching into your hands Uh, lead me where you will and make me a blessing in the days to come in Jesus name Amen okay so here we are moving along our, our facial process And we have come to the moisturizing. Last week was the first moisturizing session because there's two parts to moisture on the skin and one is oil and one is water. So we've come to the water uh, section. We talked about shalom and all the oils of paradise that the Lord wants to bestow on us. And our main scripture for that, of course, was um, Song of Solomon 4, 10 to 5, 2. And we're coming back to that scripture again. And I'm not going to read the whole thing of it. I'll leave that for you to discover as you go home and have a look at it again. But the key verse we're going to hone in on today is um, the one that says, You are uh, a garden enclosed, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. You're a fountain springing up in a garden, a well of living waters and flowing streams from Lebanon. So... um, We are actually little carbon-based units that are over 70% composition in water. And and so as your skin is the largest organ of your body, of course you'll see the manifestation of dehydration on it the fastest. And you can only actually last three or four days without water. This we know. If they were to remove all the water from the average person and just there was just you were just zapped and there was like a pile of dust and you know chemicals residue on the ground, you're only actually worth about eighteen to twenty dollars. <laughs> I need to tell you that. So that water is quite precious to you. <laughs> At current values, the chemicals are only worth that much. So to say that water is critical to you is an understatement. Um, In Genesis 3.20, Eve shows up on the scene. It's in the garden. And the actual name Eve means life spring. That's what her name is. And this is the name of our mother and the name from the beginning spoken over her by Adam from God. And this is our inheritance and our destiny that life in all forms should spring from us. And um, <clears throat> well, that's rather exciting. Um, so we're getting back to our scripture of Song of Solomon. We are a fountain seal. That's what verse 12 says. And... Why is, why is in this garden scene of the, the Lord describing our relationship with him as a garden, there's a lot of emphasis on this water, this fountain. So what's the deal with that? And it's a picture, uh, because uh, of other scriptures that we know, that it is the true source of life that is flowing into the garden. <clears throat> And this is the way, the description of the way the Lord created me to be, a conduit of life, life that flows from the throne of God. This fountain is described as being sealed. <clears throat> this means that it is protected for purity and healthfulness. It was created pristine and whole, and it, that's the proper way it's meant to function in purity. Many of us have fountains, however, that have been defiled and polluted in our lives. And we don't know how to get them cleaned up again. But when I allow the Lord to heal me through the word and through the ways he works in my life, the places that have been wounded and violated, whether that means sexually or in a capacity for love, in proper functioning of family life, the fountain through which the life I receive becomes resealed again. The Lord can reseal those fountains that have been defiled and my full capacity to function in these areas can be restored and renewed 
And some of the ways that happens is through worship and um, sexual purity. Our Romans 12, 1 verse, which says, rededicate your body as your rightful worship. Romans 12, 1 to 2, that verse is. Um, and it will reseal the fountains of your life. So, so Ezekiel 47, we're going to start there because it's a scripture that describes the river of God. And I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but what happens is the angel takes Ezekiel in his vision. He takes him to the temple. And from the temple, this is what he sees. And my guide brought me again to the door of the house of the Lord. And behold, the waters issued out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple was toward the east, and the waters came down from under. And then he brought me out by way of the north gate. I'm just skipping a little bit because this is quite a wordy passage. Uh, And, of course, this is a story where they walk through the river, it's ankle deep. Then they walk through and it's thigh deep. And then it's, you know, it gets deeper and deeper until it, it's a river that could not be passed over or through. And I'm in verse 6 now. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me and caused me to return to the bank of the river. Now when we had returned, behold, on the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and the other. And he said to me, These waters pour out toward the eastern region and down into the, uh, the Jordan Valley and on to the Dead Sea. And when they enter into the sea, the sea of putrid waters, the waters shall be healed and made fresh. And wherever the double river shall go, every living creature uh, that swarms shall live. And there shall be a great, not very great number of fish, because these waters go there that they may be healed and made fresh. And everything shall live wherever the river goes. So it's a living waters and it causes things to be healed and going on to verse 12 and on the banks of the river on both sides there shall grow all kinds of trees for food their leaf shall not fade nor shall their fruit fail um, to meet the demand each tree shall bring forth new fruit every month these supernatural qualities being because their waters came out of the sanctuary so just to give us a back picture because we've talked about Eden and of course in Eden Eden is the place where all the rivers and the waters converge and um, the trees of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is kind of another picture in the spirit and Ezekiel is seeing into the future but the theme of the waters, the waters, the living waters come from God, from the throne of God and they're a picture of the life that flows out from the Father. Uh, It's a healing water and it heals even the Dead Sea. Which incidentally um, is often used uh, scripturally in the Old Testament as a picture of a person's past or things in a life that have not produced um, the fruitfulness that was promised. It's called a double river. Uh, It has two, two functions. Not only does it heal everything it touches, but it causes supernatural growth in the trees along the banks of the river. At which are both food and healing. And in Revelations 5.5, 5, we've touched on that scripture where it says Jesus is the root and source of David. And he is the source of the springs of our lives. When we come to faith in Christ, those springs that have been shut up um, because of the fall and because of iniquity are reopened through Jesus. He's the living water and he's described himself that way in John. So our key verse that we're going to use today is kind of a funny little one, but it captures what I want to say the best. It's from Proverbs 5, 15 to 19. And it's where the preacher says, Drink waters out of your own cistern, fresh running waters out of your own well. Why should your offspring be dispersed abroad as water brooks in the street? Confine yourself to your own wife. Let your children be for you alone and not the children of strangers with you. Let your fountain of human life be blessed with the rewards of fidelity and rejoice in the wife of your youth. So the preacher is speaking, in this context, he's speaking of sexuality as a spring. And it's one of the springs of our lives. And the major emphasis of the scripture is protect your springs. Be careful what you do with your springs because especially the spring of sexuality is so powerful. It's the, it's the spring through which 
the physical issue of your life comes. And so the preacher is saying, just protect it and treasure it. Guard it and cherish it. Protect the place in your spirit that is rooted in the Lord and from it comes the issue of your life. Um, and Proverbs 4, 20 to 23 adds a little more to that. It says, My son, attend to my words, consent and submit to my sayings. Let them not depart from your sight. Keep them in the center of your heart. For they are life to those who find them, healing and health to all their flesh. Keep and guard your heart with all vigilance and above all that you guard, for out of it flows the springs of life. And we have mainly two kinds of springs in our lives. Um, I suppose if you wanted to get really, really technical about it, you could split it down into subsets, but we're not here for that. The two main kinds of springs are, are physical springs and mental springs. And I've said already that one of the main springs of, uh, for physical is sexuality. Um, and I'm going to ins- call, start to call it, um, and sometimes when people are preaching on this, and the scripture has called it children, or sometimes we call it seed, I'm going to call it issue. Because the actual word issue means an outflowing, a coming out of. That's what's in my Bible. Yes. Okay. It doesn't say issue? Okay, some of them do. And, and it captures the sense of the Hebrew word a little bit better. And so I'm going to speak of issue. But when I say issue, I mean seed or physical children, you know, mental projects that you've developed or whatever. That's what I'm referring to. You have a source in the Lord that depends on no one else. It's yours from him. It's the ability for honor and provision for your house and for your life. For you yourself as a woman, as a daughter of Zion, you have an inheritance from the Lord. And you're not dependent on anyone or anything but God and what he has ordained. And already I've spoken of issue as two types, mental issue of talents and projects or physical issue of children. Some very famous examples of mental issue, because you might be a little confused about that, are found in the people, in the stories of Joseph and Daniel. And they possessed from the Lord what the king called a rare and weighty thing. It was a discernment of wisdom and counsel and and prophetic uh, knowledge. And it was a rare and weighty thing. And it's one of the reasons we've spent so much time talking about mental frameworks. Because it's from these mental frameworks that all the mental issue of your life will be produced. And um, a renewed mind cleanses the spring of identity, the way we see ourselves. How can we produce, because the Lord says, good tree, good fruit. If we don't have a good tree of thinking in our lives, how will we produce good fruit out of it? And a renewed mind through scripture cleanses that spring of identity. So um, we need to be careful about judging people by outward appearances, especially when you're talking about mental seed. Um, Whether they're single, married, divorced, infirm, unemployed, God is judging them by their fellowship and by the issue of their life. Um, For example, most people don't think about this or realize it because Abraham is called the father of our faith. But do you realize he was actually a hundred years old before he saw any issue? That's when Isaac was born. He waited a long time because his issue was an issue of faith. And, and God, it was he was waiting for the promises. And it took a long time. And can you imagine, like... Well, yes, you can, because if you've ever waited for something for a long time, you know it can be painful and other people can drive you crazy. If I had a dime for every time someone said to me, Why aren't you married? I'd be a rich woman. <laughs> and can you imagine what it was like in, in, in the East, in the desert, uh, as a patriarch, you're this rich patriarch, and every time anybody comes in the region, they of course will come to your tent and to your camp. And you'll sit down and feed them and make them a big spread. And the first thing they'll do is look around and say, where are all your children? Can you imagine? Time after time after time, how provoking that must have been. In fact, I believe in my heart. That's why Sarah finally had enough. She just said, listen, 
I cannot be the source of your dishonor anymore. Take my maid and, you know, not for her sake. I don't believe it was for her sake. I think she was so vexed for him. That's why she did it. That's just a freebie. Okay, we'll get back on topic. So, but here's the kicker. Generations later, we are still enjoying the issue of Abraham. The issue of his life is still a benefit to us. And so we, we have to be careful about the criterion of judgment we place on other people's issue. Um, f- famous examples of phys- physical issue are the example of Rachel and Leah, uh, the wives of Jacob, who, it says in Ruth 4:11, together built up the house of Israel. That's the description of honor that is left upon them. And it's one of the reasons why scripture is so absolutely rigid about the area of sexual purity. Because sex is the spring through which this happens and nothing can mess up your life faster than defiling this spring out of the timings of God. Um, It's what this key verse that we talked about in Proverbs 5 is all about. The, The preacher is warning us be careful with this spring. It's powerful. It will want to pull you in directions that the Lord does not have for you. Um, in Genesis 3:15 to 17, that's where um, the curse is spoken over women. Uh, it has three parts. That there will be enmity between the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman. That there will be a great multiplication of sorrow in conception. A great multiplication of sorrow in childbirth, and and of course the subjugation element, mental, physical, sexual, and spiritual to men. But you see that this is focused on seed bearing, and seed bearing is absolutely tied up with feminine honor and identity, and that is why Satan attacks us so hard in this area. Just never lets up. If it's not one thing, it's another. Psalm 87, 7 says, All my springs are in you. The psalmist is praising God and he just he just has this um, realization that all the springs and wells of my life come from God. And this is a, a statement of how we want things to be. This is a, an ideal condition statement that the sources of our creativity, our creative ability, and our sexuality really would be rooted in God like we talked about last time. And so um, let's ask ourselves some questions. If the circumstances of your life changed drastically overnight, for example, the death of a spouse, uh, the death of a marriage, or emptiness syndrome, retirement, would you have the reserve in your spirit to bring in the necessary resources? Do you know where your wells and springs are from the Lord? And that doesn't mean you're actually um, practicing all of them. You know, we have times and seasons in our lives. But do you know where your giftedness is? Do you know the areas of your life when you get over here, whoo, the springs start moving. I'm just good at that from the Lord. Um, so it's a good question to ask ourselves. And one of the backstories you might enjoy reading, and I, I adore the Old Testament. I'm a big OT girl, and so you'll get lots of New Testament, Old Testament mix. And one of the stories you might want to read is Genesis 26. It's the story of Isaac, and what do you give to the son who has everything? You know, how do you, if you're God and you're dealing with Abraham's son? The boy's been raised privileged, and you know, he, he, he's a good lad, and you know, he's doing well, but how do I make him not just, he's not the God of my father, he's my God. How do I bring my son to that place? And so one of the things God does is he sends Isaac on a sojourn into enemy territory, so that Isaac learns to rely on God. And not all the legacy of his father, Abraham. And you will want to read that story. And what happens is when they enter enemy territory, Isaac says to himself, right, I remember my father Abraham dug some wells in this area. And I know where they are. But when he goes back to the wells, the enemies, the Philistines, have already filled in the wells. Now why anyone would want to fill in any wells at all in the middle of a desert, 
this sounds like pure enemy, stra- uh, like demonic strategy to me, because everybody's going to need water. But anyway, that's what their strategy is. And so he fill, he pull, digs out all the springs and wells, but then he starts to dig other ones because, of course, he runs. He wants to stay in a certain territory, and the enemy doesn't want him to stay there. So he moves and they dig wells, and they find this well, and then the enemy comes along and says, "No, no, 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 that's our well." So finally, he goes through this process several times, and he's in conflict with the people of the land. And finally, they come to him one day and say, right, make a covenant with us, because we've seen God with you, and you're blessed, and if we keep fighting with you, it won't turn out well for us. So make a covenant with us. So he does. And the very next day, the scripture says, his servants come to him, and they say, we have hit a well, and you will not believe it. And the commentators say this. They believe from the way the phraseology is used, that they hit an artesian spring. That's a whole different ballgame. Now, an artesian spring is when an underground river runs underneath and it's under great pressure and you happen to bore down until you hit that. Of course, it will send that water just with pressure right up to the top like a fountain. And it's a different thing to dig a well and have to put your bucket down and haul your water up. But when you hit the old artesian spring... Bless God. You know, this is the good stuff. And, and I put this in here as an illustration that sometimes in our lives we've got to keep digging the well till we find, we, we've got to dig out the ones the enemies have put in from our fathers. We've got to maybe dig new ones. But if we keep digging, we're going to hit the artesian. And we're going to find the places where the water comes up to us. The places in our lives that we're, we're always successful at and the Lord really blesses. And the, in fact, Jesus says exactly the same thing in John 7, 37 and 38. He says, he says, whoever believes in me, as this scripture has said, from out of his innermost being shall flow continuously springs and rivers of living water. And God will give us these places in ourselves. And, and sometimes, if you've really been in the word, I've experienced this. And and in a season of intense study or a season of intense prayer, and then I come into a situation and I don't quite know how to handle it, I can feel scripture actually rise in my spirit. Scriptures come to my mind. And I'm like, whoa, that's an artesian well of this spirit. And we can sow to that and expect the Lord to answer it. He will give us those places. Um, One of the things that the Lord laid on my heart to dwell on when I'm talking about this subject is um, a, it's called a house of David mindset. Um, in 2 Samuel 7, 8 to 16 and 18 to 29, the Lord speaks a blessing over David that I, I thought I had photocopied that verse. Oh, hang on. I have, I have, I have. Here, I'll read it to you. 2 Samuel 7. 8 to 16, and then 18 to 29. And this is the the background of the story is David is sitting in his house, and he's looking over his balcony, and he can see the tabernacle of God. He can see the ark, but it's in a tent. And he says to himself, is it right that I'm sitting here in my palace, and God's sitting in a tent? And his heart gets stirred up to build God a temple. And, and this is God's reply to him. Um, so now say this to my servant David. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I was with you wherever you went. And I have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name like that of the great men of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and be moved no more. And wicked men shall not afflict them as formerly. And from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, I will cause you to rest from your enemies. Also the Lord declares to you, he will make you a house. 
And when your days are fulfilled and you sleep with your fathers, I will set up after you your offspring who shall be born to you. I will establish his kingdom. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So basically, David's just going about his business trying to please God. And God speaks this heavy duty word over him about I will build you a house. And when the, the Old Testament often uses that phrase, house of David, house of Abraham, house of yada yada, Israel. It's the Lord speaking of a much greater thing than simply a physical house or the possessions of that person. It is more than the children they leave on the earth. The scripture is also talking about the influence, material, materially, socially, and especially spiritually, a life on the earth leaves. It's talking about the legacy, whether it be of righteousness or of wickedness, that a person invests on the earth. Man's idea of a house is, um, you know, being secure. Nice, large building, roomy living quarters, good neighborhood, security, convenience, control, insulation from disaster. But God's idea of a house is much bigger. It, to leave a lineage, a posterity, a, even a dynasty of influence. To bring blessing to all the families of the earth. God spoke it over Abraham and he spoke it over David, but he will speak the same thing over anyone, man or woman, who pursues him and who is a man after, a woman after his own heart. Those were not blessings simply reserved for those people. And Psalm 108.10 says, uh, the psalmist is saying, and uh, it's inferred to be David, who will bring me into the strong fortified city? Who will bring me to the safe place? That's a cry of our heart, you know, the safe place, the house of safety. And in 1 Chronicles 14, 1, an interesting thing happened. Uh, to David and it goes like this and Hiram king of Tyre sent messengers to David and cedar timbers with masons and carpenters to build him a house and David perceived that the Lord had established and confirmed him as king over Israel okay so picture this you've been chased all over the countryside by Saul for a few years in fact you've been chased so hard and so vigorously finally one day you throw up your hands and say if I don't get out of Israel, I'm going to die. He's going to chase me till he kills me. So you're forced to go over into enemy territory. You've lived out of tents. You've lived in caves. You've lived on the bare ground for who knows how long. And one day, there's a caravan of carpenters. You realize God has built you. Not only just he has planted you in Jerusalem, he has planted you in Hebron, and he's given you this kingdom to oversee and to shepherd. He's building you an actual house. And um, he, when he saw the carpenters come, he realized the Lord was saying to him, settle here. Your, your days of wrapping up all your bedroll and your tent, they're over. I will give you a physical house. And that's how he knew God was establishing his word to him. And in fact, the protected house of Job provoked Satan to complain to God. And Satan said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've conferred prosperity and happiness upon him in the work of his hands. And his possessions have increased in the land. And that's the Lord's will to hedge us about and our house about with protection. You know. And in fact, uh, another place you might want to have a look at is Job 29. Because Job actually himself describes the life that Satan's complaining about. What it is like to be a life on a house hedged about by God. Job 29 describes that. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24 to 27, that everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. 
because it had been founded on the rock. And then he goes on to describe the opposite. It is the will of the Lord that your life leaves on the earth such a mark of distinction, such an issue that is absolutely unique for this time and season, uh, for such a time as this, as Mordecai says to Esther. The power of a life far exceeds the actual days that it spends upon the earth. And we're still reaping the legacy of these great men of God, of the house of Abraham and the house of David. And as I began to sh- share this story, you know, the Lord began to speak to me about this whole house deal. And here's little, little Crystal, not even with her own little established place, and, you know, and God's talking, lineage, dynasty, you know, I'm like, whoa. Who are you talking to? You know, and and um, my response was kind of like Mary, Lord, how shall this be, seeing as I have no husband? You know, and uh, he answered me, and he answered by Proverbs nine one to five, and he said, "This wisdom shall build your house." And do you know that the master architect will give you the house of your dreams if you let him build it? And if you resist the temptation to build it yourself. Um, I was one time uh, up staying in Signal Hill looking after some children. And I was, it was for a wealthy family. And it was in this great big mansion. And in the area surrounding were about ten show homes that these developers were building. And so one of the girls that I was looking after and I said, let's go look at all the show homes. So we went through about seven or eight of them. And because I'm a designer, I'm you know, doing the critique of, mm, like this, don't like that, mm, you know. And we're going, and I, there's a slight increase. As we move our way down the street, the houses are getting bigger and showier and yada, yada. And finally, I step into this one. And I'm really picky about layouts. I hate too many walls and doors. And, and I, as I'm moving to this house, I'm like, whoa, I really like the layout of this house. And, of course, it was all fully furnished, fully decorated, right down to the dishes in the cupboard and everything. And as I left the house, I said, you know what? I could live in a house like that. I, that is a, that's me. I like it. And as we were going out the door, the um, person in charge of the show home said it said that's a 2.6 million dollar house there you go yeah and but yeah, but the lord used it as an illustration to me sometimes um he has to bring you through levels of faith until you have enough faith to step into the place he wants to give you now I, I had that testimony in my spirit of feeling like I'd come home now whether that means I'll actually step into a 2.6 mil you know a state or whether that was just a picture in the spirit doesn't really matter God made the point with me dream bigger than you're dreaming because I have big things for you and um He prepares us for that. But if you don't understand and guard the springs and streams of your life, you get diverted really easy. Because waiting for promises, just the flesh hates it, and it wants the inclination to take things into its own hands and build its own house. But Psalm 127, 5 says this, Except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman wakes but in vain it is vain for you to rise up early to take rest late to eat the bread of anxious toil he gives blessings to his beloved in sleep behold children are a heritage from the Lord and the fruit of the womb a reward as arrows in the hand of a warrior so are the children of one's youth happy blessed fortunate is the woman whose quiver is filled with them they will not be put to shame when they speak to their adversaries in the city's gates and the Lord's comment on a life that is busy but not with him at the center of it is this it is vain it is in vain and it is vanity it will produce fruit but not legacy that the Lord would have had that life produce. And notice just in this scripture that children are both an inheritance and a reward from the Lord. They are one of his most powerful strategies for dealing with the enemies in our lives. And 
I'm lo- I want to touch on Proverbs 31. Yes, I know, the dreaded Proverbs 31 woman. <laughs> you just knew we had to go there at some point. Okay, so batten down the hatches. No, we're just going to touch on it. And what I want to say about this, as you read it again, read Proverbs 31 again, and you will see that what characterizes this woman is an extraordinarily fruitful life. Proverbs 31. And this is God's intent for us. This woman knows how to run her life and get fruit out of it. It's not about being busy. It's about knowing the place of your greatest fruitfulness and productivity. She's a thoroughly prepared woman of God. And note that she, you don't get the sense she's a clinging vine, that she's codependent. Okay? On anyone. And it's about the balance of both physical and mental issue. And for women, this is a huge thing. It is very hard for us to get that balance between those things. Um, it's, it's the trick. And, you know, if you've made the decision to be a wife and a mother and invest in your children, there's nonetheless this part of you that feels like, you know, I'm putting this whole thing on hold that is my mental issue, that is my creativity in this area. So women, it's very hard um, to, to balance it. We're coming back to Proverbs 31. We just are going to skim by that right now. Well, one story I really want to um, bring to your attention is Joshua 15, 13 to 20. And it's just one of these crazy little esoteric stories tucked away in scripture that I think has just got a bucket full of truth in it. And it's a story of Caleb and his daughter. Now Caleb was one of the twelve spies that got sent out into the promised land. But he and Joshua, out of twelve alone, came back and said, We can do it! We can take it! But the other ten said, Oh no, they're they're giants in the land. You know, they'll just consume us. But so what happened was Caleb received from the Lord a blessing because he was faithful and said, Yes, the Lord will do it. He he had received this inheritance. But he had this daughter. And the inference of Scripture is she was a chip off the old block. She was as feisty as her daddy. And she wanted to take a no for an answer. And so one day, Caleb said, oh my word, what am I going to do with that girl? How am I going to marry her? I can't find a man strong enough. And he comes up with a plan. And he says, ha, I've got it. That, there's a city over there that's still got sons of giants in it and needs to be captured. And so whoever takes that city will be strong enough to be a husband for my, my daughter. And so, sure enough, her cousin, who she's been warring with all these years, you know, how, you know how you do that brother-sister thing, and then all of a sudden there's that one day where, ooh, you know, it could be different. All oh, the chemistry changes. But they, the two of them they just can't quite seem to get it together. So Joshua, uh, inter, uh, Caleb intervenes in the situation, and he says, look, either go take that city and straighten this thing out or whatever. I'll give her to somebody else. So the long and short is they get married. But one day, and her name is Aksa, Aksa, and Aksa says to Othelnail, darling, you just sit right down there. You just relax, darling, I, I'm just going to run over. Don't you worry your pretty little head. I'm just going to run over and talk to Daddy for a few minutes because he's, they've been given this field. But the problem is um, it's a field without springs. So they've got to run the sheep or whatever far to be able to water them. And so she goes over to Daddy. Hi, Daddy. How you doing? So he takes one look at her and says, Hello, darling. What do you need? What, you, <laughs> what are you here for? So Daddy, just love the field. Love the husband. But here's the problem. He's got to go all that far away over to water the sheep. But when he comes home, Daddy, he's tired. He's really tired, if you know what I mean. And this is not good. But I see in that field over there, you've got upper and lower springs. And Daddy, I would really appreciate if you'd give me the upper and lower springs too. So he gives them to her, of course. And, you know, we need to be like that with the Lord. Ask him for the upper and lower springs. We've got areas in our lives that are dry that we can't, you know, we can't make them work properly. We need to be bold with our Father and say, Lord, where are the upper and lower springs? I need you to open them up for me. 
I need them. And have you asked for them? Do you know where the springs are? Do you know the areas where they're found? And um, Psalm 84, 5 to 7 says, Blessed is the, and I'm going to say women instead of man, and I'm going to change the pronouns too, just so that it's personal for us. Blessed is the woman whose strength is in you, in whose hearts are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of weeping, she will make it a place of springs. The early rain and also fills the pools with blessings. She goes from strength to strength, increasing in victorious power. Each of them appears before God in Zion. And I chose that scripture because it's a truth that the, probably the place of your greatest pain, at the place where you are most greatly attacked, is a good indicator in your life of where your springs are. Because Satan doesn't waste ammunition on places that aren't powerful to you that you cannot access powerful and, be, and become a danger to him and in fact this is an ancient ancient strategy in Judges 5 Deborah describes that one of the strategies the Midianites used to do is the archers would hide around the wells and when people came down to draw water they'd shoot at them and attack them is this an ancient strategy and Satan has not changed at all and there is a place of honor to women that is greater than mere fruit bearing um, it's a place where we come into covenant with God uh, we, when we're more concerned about building up his house than our own and um, the Lord wants us to get to that place he wants us to enjoy our own springs and streams but he wants us to bear fruit for his kingdom not just for our own little house and a person uh, who had a revelation of this was Hannah and if you want to read the backstory of Hannah it's in 1 Samuel 1 and it carries on for a couple of verses and it's about Hannah and how she became the woman the woman of the vow and the vow broke the power of the barrenness that was holding her life in check and holding her fruitfulness in check and sometimes God leaves barrenness in a certain place for a season and a reason and we, it is just such a mystery and women struggle with it not just women but men too um, but it is true that God can leave barrenness to get our hearts to get our spirits to a place where we can receive the real blessing that he wants to give us. So, and make your seed a Nazarite dedicated to God. And that, that is a pretty good way to break the power of barrenness. Uh, for example, an example of this is Luke 1.35. When the Holy Spirit impregnates you, it overcomes all natural obstacles. Mary found that out. Elizabeth found that out. Various other people have found that out. That... Um, the Holy Spirit can really break all the rules. And um, for Mary, the power of natural conception was completely circumvented. And for Elizabeth, the power of age and barrenness were also shattered. Um, so how can we recognize? We, we want to be hydrated. We want to be flowing in our springs and streams. But sometimes we get so dehydrated. So how can we recognize when we are dehydrated? One of the ways it manifests is through criticism, depression, uh, neediness or a hunger for affirmation, for a hunger for attention, rancor, uh, which is like just criticism and harsh speaking, and a lack of energy. In Proverbs, the scripture says that a broken spirit will dry up the bones. If you've been through long seasons of grieving, or hard circumstances it causes dehydration if you've been in circumstances that have where you have not uh, been able to express yourself you've been oppressed and uh, your emotions have been repressed um, remember we had that scripture last week that says envy, jealousy and passion are like rottenness in the bones and you know sometimes when you have a virus and you're sickening for something you can just drink water, 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 water it seems like you can't, you can't get enough and that's what it's like in the spirit 
when you're repressed in your emotions. Um, it can really dry you up. If you have a lack of self-worth and no one's ever taught you um, what you're worth or spoken affirming words to you, um, you have a, a bit of a victim mentality at work in your life, this just will dry up things for you too. You, we need to understand our worth. Um, in the Lord and keep our spirits hydrated also if you are extremely fatigued if you've been through a long circumstances and situations where you've just been in to the max with energy <laughs> yeah. somebody wake up Tina <laughs> yeah go, go ahead yeah 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 no problem no problem but if you've been in extreme fatigue Mentally and spiritually or physically, you will be dehydrated. So, how to rehydrate? Um, the number one thing would obviously be rest and relaxation. You've got to get yourself physically back up to par so that you can um, absorb these things again. Um, also, doing activities that are positive, affirmative, just plain fun. Life is so heavy. You know, we need to, to laugh and enjoy ourselves and hydrate our spirits again. Come, come back to the center of who we are again. Um, things, do activities that give energy to your spirit. There's activities that take energy from you and there are activities that give energy to you. Spend time with people who think you are the bee's knees and that you are valuable, that have fun with you, you laugh with them, and that people that can see the gifts of God in you and appreciate them and affirm them. Good fellowship is key to this stuff. And also, uh, going a step deeper, relationships of depth and length will always bring water and hydration into your life. And it creates deep springs in the spirit. We can tap each other's springs, you know, and, and, and feed them. And it's important. And of course, prayer, praise, and the study of the word. This is basic, you know, standard operating procedure. But also, not just to come into the presence of the Lord and do, 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 do. But to come into rest. And to say, Lord, I'm just meeting with you. To have worship and just to have intimacy, even when you don't have anything to say. God just wants you to come and rest in his presence. Um, deal with deep-seated anger and oppression. We've talked about that in the uh, rancid oil. How, how bad that is for us to hold on to that stuff over the long term. And just return to the eternal truths of scripture. You know, that you are loved of God, that your source of your identity is from the Lord. And, you know, this too shall pass that I'm going through. Underneath my life are the everlasting arms of God, and he's not going to let me go. And Isaiah 12, you might want to have another look at that whole scripture. Because this scripture equates the wells of salvation with joy. With joy shall you draw water from the wells of salvation. So one of the ways that you know that your spirit is properly hydrated is by the manifestation of joy in your life. How much joy do I have right now? And I'm not talking about happiness because, woo, I've got a big deal down at, yeah, such and such. I'm talking about the joy that is just deep and sustains me. When I wake up in the morning, I'm, I'm just happy to be alive. I'm grateful to God. I'm thankful for the things of my life. That joy. So in closing, I'm, I'm just going to draw your attention to Psalm 103.1. that says, Praise the Lord. Let everything that is deepest within me praise the Lord. And that's what we're aiming at right here and with our session last week. That our, the roots of our, our identity are run deep down into the love of Christ. And that way we're, we're just sucking up those living waters, you know. And that's where we're drawing our strength off. The love of Christ, the fact that we are loved, the fact that He is love, period. And this is where we're drawing our identity off. And so that everything that is deepest within me will praise the Lord. And my worship is authentic before Him. 
Um, the Council of the Seraglio today, girls. I'm just going to read these questions. And don't, you don't need to write them down because I've got a question sheet right here. How would I describe the level of my hydration right now? What do I desperately need to recover moisture to my spirit? Where do I struggle with constant dehydration? How much joy do I have manifesting in my life? Am I enjoying the fountains and springs of my life? Or are they muddied and sour? What are the wells of my family lines? The areas of anointing and giftedness that seem to run down genetically a repeating pattern. You might want to think about that because this can be a real blessing. It can be a real blessing when you can start identifying the springs of your family line. It will save you a lot of time reinventing the wheel. Um, List and identify the mental and physical issue of uh, your life this far. Do I know where the springs of my life are? Where would I like them to be? What is my artesian spring? The place in my life where I constantly have success no matter what. What promises has God made to the house of blank? And of course wherever there's these big blanks that's for you to fill in your name. I've also included a separate sheet which is a little bit of homework I've done in the past. It's called um, Seed Promises. These are all the promises in Scripture. Well, I should say all the promises. The ones I've run across so far that pertain to God blessing your children, your work, your seed, your issue. And so I thought, girls, I'm just going to give them to you and you can work your way through and begin to pray. If there's an area of your life where God is holding, uh, uh, the enemy is holding you up, you know, you may find a scripture that pertains exactly to praying against that thing and breaking the power of barrenness over it. So I include that um, and that will give you lots of stuff to have fun with for a good long time. So we're just going to take some time. I just want to share this one more scripture. You know, last week I did included the scriptures on the question sheet for you to put your name in and to put those scriptures up somewhere. And, And I encourage you that when you walk by them, read them out loud. There's something that begins to happen when you verbalize them and put them out on the earth. And one, uh, this one that I've chosen, uh, Job 29, 19 to 20, this is a confession of Job. He says, my root is spread out and open to the waters. The dew lies all night upon my branch. My glory and honor are fresh in me, being constantly renewed. And my bow gains ever new strength in my hand. Fruitfulness, if ever you heard of it. Numbers 24, 7 says, and I'm putting my own name in here, Crystal shall pour water out of her own buckets. She shall have her own sources of rich blessing and plenty, and her offspring shall dwell by many waters. That, God is speaking that to Israel, but of course we're the Israel of God now. And Colossians 2.10, And I, Crystal, am in him, made full, and having come to fullness of life. In Christ I am filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and reach full spiritual stature. So I leave that uh, for you 